week. A rough week for all of America and particularly for our veterans, military families, caregivers and survivors. The longest period of war in US history is ending. We've never gone through something like this in our nation's history. That means we're confused. It means we're sad. It means emotions are up and down. We're trying to make heads or tails of the news and information that's being thrown at us constantly. We're seeing images on television. We're seeing rhetoric on social media. What we wanna do this evening is step back from it all. We wanna give you an opportunity to ask questions to some of my friends who are experts in the mental and emotional health field to sort out all the chaos that you see happening on television and that you hear happening across social media. Tonight is about you and the questions and the dialogue you wanna have. Every single day, our veterans, our caregivers, survivors, and military families are providing selfless acts of love in their service for this country and in their service for one another. Tonight, we're here to support you. And I wanna introduce my friends who join us. Start with Dr. Sonia Norman, who currently serves as the director of PTSD at, at the VA Center for PTSD. Dr. Amit Saud is one of the world's leading experts on resilience and well being. He was previously at the Mayo Clinic and is currently the executive director of the Global Center for Resiliency and Well Being. Dr. Caitlin Thompson is the vice president of community partnerships at Cohen Veterans Clinic. And finally, Rebecca Mullaney is a licensed mental health counselor who's been working with us at the Dole Foundation and so many other organizations in her stewardship and support of veterans and military families. I encourage all of you to enter your questions in our chat or via the Q&A box. We've designed this session to answer questions directly from those of you who've given your time this evening. So let us know what's on your mind. Finally, I wanna let you know that this is just the opening round of our foundation support and that of our valuable partners. We are 100% committed to be here today, tomorrow, and the next day. We recognize the effects of this withdrawal from Afghanistan are going to be long-term. So we wanna hear from you, what you need today, what you need tomorrow, and what you need the days after that. We're with you every step of the way. So Dr. Norman, I'm gonna to turn to you for our first question, and it's an important one. We know so many veterans are suffering. We've heard from lots of caregivers and family members that they need help translating what their veterans are witnessing. What's the VA doing right now for veterans who are in crisis? Yeah, that's a very important question. First of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for having me today. I'm, I'm so glad to be here, to be able to be part of this. Um, let me mention um, some of the things the VA is doing. The VA is here to support veterans who served in Afghanistan and all veterans who are having a hard time because of what's happening in Afghanistan. We've sent emails and shared blog posts with suggestions for ways to cope through this difficult time. And we encourage anyone who has a mental health provider at the VA to talk with them or to request to see one if they don't. We also have the vet centers who have counselors who are available to offer support. And I wanna remind everyone of um, the crisis line. If a veteran is in crisis or concerned about one who is, um, the veteran crisis line has caring qualified VA responders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'll say the number now, um, it's 1-800-273-8255 and press one. Um, I encourage you to save this number and use it when you need it. Thank you so much, Dr. Norman. We're gonna put that number right in the chat box that folks can um, access it right away. Rebecca, really important question for you. We have gotten um, a lot of feedback from family members, caregivers, children of veterans, that veterans are calling into question their service, the mission they so honorably undertook to protect our country in Afghanistan. What advice do you give to those families who are counseling their veterans that this decision to withdraw in no way, shape or form reflects on that honorable service to our country? Yeah, another good question, Steve. Thanks for having me and thanks for everybody being here with me. Um, 
this is a question I've heard this week um, in my practice and with friends and family. And, you know, when we have these questions of, you know, what are we doing with our lives and why did we do this? I, I always encourage people to go back to their why initially. So everybody joined the military for some reason, right? And that was probably from a really good place. And we aren't, we on the ground are not the, not in charge of what happens, what political things happen, what legislation happens. We have to go back to what, what our why was, why we chose this path. Um, so if you're supporting someone who's struggling with, you know, the news and feeling like their, their efforts were in vain, I would ask you to, you know, ask them about what was meaningful about their service. Ask them about, you know, the people they met or the people that, that they will never forget, the people that they're worried about. Ask them about the good memories and um, what it means to them to have served and to wear that badge as a, vet a veteran. Thanks, Rebecca. Something else we've been hearing that I wonder if someone would comment on is, you know, these veterans honorably undertook their mission and our country's been safe, safer, and our world's been safer for 20 years um, because of that service. Um, would one of you be willing to, to speak to our veterans directly about that point? Yeah, I agree, uh, Steve, that thanks for having us. <clears throat> the millions of uh, girls are going to college right now or school because of the service that you provided. Our country has been saved. Tens of thousands of women are going to college in Afghanistan because of the service you provided. The struggle we have with, with what is ha happening right now is that sense of loss of meaning in the past and loss of hope in the future. But the meaning that you provided was complete in and, of, in and of itself, and the hope is still there. So keep your hope and meaning alive. What you did was precious and important and selfless. Dr. Sood, thank you. That was so important. Caitlin, I'm going to turn to you with an important question. You've worked a lot within and outside the VA in your work. How can we educate civilian medical providers that are within and outside the VA system so they can better understand how this is impacting veterans in real time who might not be necessarily inside the VA. Yeah, this is such a such an important question. We know that you know there are organizations like Cohen Veterans Network and others that are specifically able to do what VA does and have that military cultural competence. So to be able as a mental health provider or any sort of provider to get some of that language going so that the veteran or is who or the military family member who's sitting in front of you doesn't have to spend the time to educate you. Um, I think that Psych Armor has some really good bite-sized um, um, uh, uh, um, programs for how to how to get some military cultural competence. VA has some as well. Um, and I know we all need bite size right now because everybody is so overwhelmed. Um, so uh, definitely don't be scared to to reach out and try to figure out um, and figure out what the how how to talk with with a veteran um, or military family member that you're treating. Thanks, if Caitlin. I can um, share a resource as well, I'd love to add to what Caitlin um, said. Uh, we have the VA PTSD consultation program, which is actually the program I run for the National Center for PTSD. And we're here, um, we're a group of senior clinicians and administrators and researchers who have many years of expertise in PTSD available to talk by email or by phone with a clinician treating veterans um, at any time to answer questions related to trauma, PTSD, certainly what's happening with, in Afghanistan right now and how that's affecting the veterans they treat and they serve. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us and I'll, I'll say another, this time a website, not a phone number, but ptsdconsult at va.gov. This is specifically for clinicians, for um, any kind of provider, um, but it's a great resource for folks who maybe don't treat veterans all the time or for those who do and have any question. Thanks, Sonia. Sonia, Rebecca, I have a, a, an important question for both of you that I just saw Nicole ask in the chat room. Um, she's a wife, a spouse to a veteran. Um, how does she, she wants to talk as a wife and a spouse to her veteran about what's going on. How does she do that as a wife and not as a therapist? 
something I, my husband would say that I need to work on every day because I'm both a wife and a therapist. Um, and we, my, my husband is a Iraq veteran and we talked about this this week, obviously, um, as it was coming up and it was, it was difficult for me uh, at first to not want to counsel it, you know, and, and, and help him through it as a client. But what I really made myself do was listen. Um, you know, he is very educated on everything that's happening in the world as a master's in international affairs. And I let him teach me things about his experience and, and then just asked a few questions about what he was feeling, because I think the main emotion that he was experiencing was anger. Um, and behind anger was a lot more and he just needed a place to get it out. And then I think we went outside and, you know, probably did something with our horses because getting out and moving is really helpful for us. So I'm not sure if that totally answers her question, but, um, I take the therapist hat off, uh, in the house as much as I can. Other comments that speak to our spouses of veterans? I don't have a comment about a spouse, but I have a comment about that general question because what I've been hearing from some veterans this week is my colleagues, the people that I work with who don't know much about veterans have come up to me or my friends on Facebook have written, hey, sorry about what's going on in Afghanistan. And that's like it. And that's and, and the veterans are like, at least they're acknowledging that this was something important in my life. But at the same time, it feels so kind of disingenuous. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is what is the best way to approach somebody who may be really experiencing this dif difficulty, experiencing this tragedy so hard? And I think I think it would be good to start by saying, hey, I just want to let you know that I can imagine things must be really tough for you right now as we're all listening to what's going on in Afghanistan. And I just want to let you know I'm here for you. I'm here if you want to talk. Because some some of the veterans that I spoke with are like, I don't want to talk about it. So it's, give, it's giving them that option and that opening to talk about it, but also showing that empathy and really understanding of how how deep this uh, experience is for the the veterans who have been there for here, been in this for and the military families who have been in this for the last twenty years. That's such an important point. Uh, I have a colleague who lost a son. He has five kids. Uh, at his funeral, one of his friends said, "At least you have the other four. You could be grateful for that." That's such a bad way to help someone. So do not fast track to meaning or gratitude. Validate, 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 listen, listen, listen. Those are probably the two most important things you can do. Dr. Yeah, Sue. I think so. Go ahead. Sometimes we freeze up because we think we have to say the right thing. The words have to come out just so. And often it's just being there, just showing that support, just listening and no pressure to speak, no pressure to say anything. Just be present it can be the most helpful thing. That's great advice. Dr. Sue, I'm going to turn to you and turn to the children inside these military families. And, you know, we've recently launched a really important initiative at the Dole Foundation focused on hidden helpers, the, the children and caregiving families, because we know they're seeing so much unfold and far beyond their years of psychological development. Many of these children are watching these images on television screens or hearing about them from their friends. Can you talk to the family members who are on about how they process and take their children through a time like this? Yeah, I think the first step before speaking to them is to listen to them. Uh, what do they know about this? What are their emotions like? Like today I was talking to a child about uh, what do you think is happening in Afghanistan? And uh, she said, oh, we're in the US is Afghanistan. So I certainly changed the direction of my conversation. But once they share with you what they are observing, what they're feeling, uh, you wanna validate those observations and feelings and add to those observations and feelings, give them the truth. They, they like to see the truth. Of course, you don't have to go into all the details, but they, they very quickly catch if you're not, you know, if you're wishy-washy and that sort of thing. And share your own vulnerability, your own personal emotions. Daddy is sad or daddy is angry or daddy is scared. And, and that's how I'm processing my emotion. And some days I'm better, other days I'm not. They love to see your vulnerability and are inspired by it. 
Um, I would reassure them that there's a lot of good people who are working together to help us out. Uh, one family actually took the map and showed, you know, this is where we are. Uh, what's happening is so far from us, so you'll be okay. Children are very scared. And, and finally, ask again uh, if they have any questions. Keep that open space. In one situation, you know, one child saw there was guerrilla warfare happening. So this uh, this child thought that there is a bunch of gorillas that are attacking the town. So they're looking out the window to see when when will the gorillas come into my home. So do not assume that uh, they have sometimes magical thinking and such. So keep those uh, those thoughts in mind. So what I do is ask, validate, inform, share, reassure, and ask again. That's the sequence I usually take. Dr. Sood, so, so helpful. Thank you so much for those really practical ways of thinking about those conversations. Any other comments from anyone else on the children's front? Okay, I'm gonna turn to Rebecca. Um, you've had, as you've explained, uh, family members who served your spouse, um, and you've also suffered a loss as a result of this war. Can you talk about how that impacts you and what advice you have for other survivors who may be feeling an overwhelming sense of grief? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, I'm uh, widowed and I lost my husband after, uh, not in Afghanistan, but to Iraq, um, my first husband. And my, I remarried, my new husband is also a veteran. Um, and so we're, we're deep in it. Um, personally, um, when this, sort of blew up into my face and I saw it on TV and sort of checking the news. Uh, obviously anxiety rose and it felt very reminiscent of that uncontrollable what's happening, who's going to go, who's coming, what's happening kind of feeling that you feel as a military spouse often. Um, and then, you know, my, I, like I said, I talked to my husband about this and his, and you know, how it was impacting him. And then, you know, Monday was the anniversary of my very best friend's fiance being shot down in Afghanistan from his helicopter. And so I just decided I needed to call her. Um, we usually send each other some chocolate or something on those days, but um, I, I needed to call her and check on her. And another friend that served in Afghanistan, she's trying to get her interpreter out. And so, it, you know, it's everywhere. It's everywhere we look and everyone has a different experience with what's going on. The best advice I can ever give someone and what I tell my clients all the time and what I actually practice in my own life is managing my diet of this. So how much I take in, where I take it in from, am I reading it, am I watching it, am I listening to it, how many sensory you know, activities am I engaging in. And for me, the safest way is for me to read what's happening. I, I don't like the news, I, it overwhelms me. And with a lot of my clients, they feel the same way. Um, the best advice is to manage what you're doing, what you're taking in, and then what kind of you're giving yourself to support. So, you know, I run a horse farm, so I go ride a horse or go pet a horse or go outside or pull a weed, you know, whatever I need to do to take care of myself. Thank you, Rebecca. Great advice. Other advice for survivors who are really feeling a sense of grief and loss during this time? I think just in general, just re re recognizing that th the grief is just compounded, right? It's, it isn't just that grief now that you're, you've experienced of a loss of that loved one. Um, it's also then the loss of, it, it's grieving what happened. It, it's also grieving what could have been. It's grieving how the country is now, how this country is, how Afghanistan is. So it's just very, it's very, uh, it's complicated. And I, I really appreciate too what Rebecca said about how we have to remember that everybody grieves differently. Well, everybody is responding to this differently too. And however the response is, that's okay. There shouldn't be any comparison of like, well, so-and-so is feeling angry and I should be feeling more angry, but I'm feeling more sad or I'm feeling more overwhelmed or I'm feeling more helpless. It is what it is. What you're feeling is okay, and so to just really accept that, and um, and work through whatever that emotion is, even if it's multiple emotions, which it probably is too. Um, but just you know, this is this is compounded grief, grief upon grief upon grief that um, we just all have to be recognizing and, and caring for each other about. One practice I do, Steve, is what I like to call zoom in and zoom out. 
uh, zoom in is uh, picking the load of the next one minute. I often do this with patients, let's say, who have a serious diagnosis. For example, uh, if I'm getting colonoscopy next Monday, uh, my entire weekend is going to be thinking about colonoscopy, but I say, okay, I'm going to live just one hour at a time or one minute at a time. So that's zooming in. And zooming out is if my next few weeks are going to be difficult, I will think about what am I going to do? Uh, am I planning a vacation to Italy in you know next year or something else that is exciting that is farther out? So you sort of take control of where you are placing your attention. It's that intermediate zone where the maximum pain is. So either you come completely into the moment or you really zoom out. Both places can give you refuge. That is excellent advice, Dr. Sood, and a great segue into my next question. And because, and, and Dr. Norman, I'd love for you to take the lead on this one to start. Many folks are zoomed in on those television screens right now, right? Um, that's why Dr. Sood, I love this idea of zooming out. And I'm, I'm hoping that's what we're doing a little bit right now is zooming out together um, to, to, to make heads or tails of, of all the emotions and feelings that we have um, around the chaos that's happening. And Dr. Norman, we're getting lots of questions about from spouses and family members who wonder if they should try to monitor the amount of television watching or social media viewing that's happening with their veteran. Do you have advice or perspective on, you know, ar around that particular topic? Yes, definitely. I thought Rebecca touched on that really nicely as well. Um, it can definitely, you know, as we know with social media and doom scrolling through our phones, through the news, it, you know, a minute of checking can turn into an hour, can turn into half a day. And, um, you know, for some veterans that can be very triggering right now. So it could be that, you know, you want, everyone wants to stay up to date. You don't want to, you know, put your, your head in a hole and, you know, ignore everything that's going on. You want to know what's going on in the world. And so what's that um, point where you go from sort of healthy, knowing what's happening to kind of losing yourself down the rabbit hole and, and getting increasingly upset and increasingly sort of worked up about the same thing really over and over, but you kind of can't stop. And I think for everyone, how to find that point um, from kind of keeping yourself informed to taking yourself down that very upsetting rabbit hole is individual. Um, I loved Rebecca's suggestion of like, for me, reading is a little bit more distant and a little better. Um, you know, I can really see that. I can also see you know, if you have the TV on in the background and sort of always there, and maybe you're listening to some really angry commentators, how that could be very agitating. So maybe again, like say, okay, I'm going to turn in, tune in for 15 minutes, or I'm going to read the top stories through my news scroll for five minutes, and then I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to turn off the TV and not have it in the background. So I think people have to figure out where it's too much. Like, where's that point of, okay, I know enough and I can turn it off and maybe in four hours, I'll check for 10 minutes again to see if anything major has happened and that's enough. So it's finding that limit for yourself or your family member. That's really super helpful. Any other thoughts on that? Once I was uh, seeing a, a gentleman with advanced cancer, uh, Steve, and uh, he was uh, taking a bunch of dietary supplements. So I asked him, are these supplements helping you? And he said, no, they're not helping me. Then why are you taking them? Uh, and he said, because that's all I can control. So there are times in life when you do not have stuff uh, that you can control, a lot of big things, but there's still something you can control. You can control what you eat. You can control who you talk to, how much uh, uh, news that you allow to get into your brain's, uh, you know, uh, space and and such. You you can control your reading about faith or spirituality. You can think about writing something, doing something creative. So the more you can deploy your mind uh, towards these activities, the better. Because at the end of the day, your dinner experience is not what's in the menu. It is what is on the table. What's on the menu menu of the planet uh, is very difficult, but what you invite on your table is of your choosing. And, and that's what the control you have. Dr. Sood, I love that concept of choice, which, you know, we all have choices we can make about what we consume, what we view, who we listen to, who we talk to. Part of that has been challenged by the resurgence of COVID and the Delta variant and some of the restrictions that we're seeing, you know, rear their heads in, in states across the country. Um, I wonder if, if someone could talk about how 
we counsel our families um, uh, as they're dealing with Afghanistan um, and the pressures that were already there with COVID, um, some people that we've heard from say, I can't tell if this is anxiety related to Afghanistan or if it's re anxiety related to COVID or it's both. Help us sort that out a little bit. Who wants to take that one? I can speak to that as I did today with someone in session. Um, one thing that's been helpful for me is to level with my clients and share that I have fears of this and none of us have ever worked as clinicians in a pandemic uh, before with the end of a war. Like this is all very, very new and very complicated. And it's not, in my opinion, it's not super important where the anxiety is, which thing is making you anxious. The fact is you're having symptoms. And so to be able to recognize those, first of all, is great that you're, you're that self-aware that you can, you can tell I'm feeling this. And then you have to figure out what to do with it. And this panel will tell you all day long that, you know, taking care of yourself, getting around friends, even virtually if you can, uh, if, you, if we have to quarantine again, um, getting outside where it's safe to do that, um, doing hobbies, reading books, things that you, you enjoy. When we talk to the caregiver community, the work that I do within the caregivers, um, I try to remind people that before you were a caregiver, you were a person and you were your own person and before COVID and before war, we were people and we have things that are special about us and, and unique. And the more we plugged into those, the better we will feel. That's great, Rebecca, other thoughts? I, I might add as a physician, Steve, that the, the virus uh, really loves for us to have stress because when we have stress, our genes and immune system, they turn towards more inflammation and poorer antiviral immunity. So if you really want to protect yourself, what you want to do is tell your genes and immune system, I'm having, I'm having a decent time on this planet. So when you tell them that, they start preparing you for longevity. When you tell them I'm miserable, I'm stressed out, they say, oh, my owner is gonna die pretty soon. So let me inflame him or her, let me decrease his antiviral immunity. So, so this leads to stress suppressing immunity, which causes more stress. You don't wanna be in that cycle. Uh, I know it's not easy for many of us, but the more effort you make, the, the easier it gets. And, and you have wonderful people trying to help you. And I think one of the first steps there is to become aware of this science and develop intentionality in what you allow to get into your brain and where you focus. It's a super stressful time. We can't control the virus. I mean, we can, we can't, we can control, we can do yeah. certain things to stay safer, but we can't make the pandemic go away single-handedly. Yeah. We can't control what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Um, so all of those things are incredibly anxiety provoking um, and we can't change that. And so I think looking at those things that you do have some control over and particularly things that feel meaningful, you know, what is it about Afghanistan that's so upsetting right now? That's going to be different for different people. There, you know, there's some things that feel universal, but, but you know, different pieces of it are gonna feel the most painful for different people. So maybe it's someone you're worried about that's still there that you couldn't you know, get out. Um, so, so that shows that you care deeply about people, that when you care about someone, you wanna make them safe, you wanna um, you know, protect them. So maybe there's not much you can do there now, but is there someone here in your life? Are there ways that you could show that value here by um, you know, taking care of your family, doing volunteer work that takes, helps keep, you know, vulnerable people safe. So we take that value and we find a way to do something even when in the bigger sense, the thing we really want to do, we can't control. Really, so, really important perspective. I'll, I'll just add one more line to that. Someone said, you know, it feels like you're dry, you're flying a single engine plane, not knowing how much gas is left. Uh, there's just so much lack of control. And I think that is a time which calls us for us to care for each other because one of the best ways to heal yourself is to heal others. These are the times that are calling us to support each other even more. You know, Dr. Sood, my mother taught me growing up that um, it's hard on our bodies when we express anger and when we're mean, right? And, and those, those cycles we get in in social media where you're seeing people being critical or it can, it can create a cycle inside your body that isn't healthy, is that right? 
Yeah, actually, to quote a couple of studies, uh, when you get really that rage, uh, you increase your risk of sudden death by about eightfold. And I do not want to give anyone the power to increase my risk of sudden death, heart attack, stroke, or dementia. And that is why I choose to focus on what I want to focus on. And I do not want to give others uh, the power, those who I don't want to be in my story, I don't want them to write the title of my story. And so yes, rage is very inflammatory. It's not healthy for your heart. It hurts your overall being. And, uh, and the more you can find ways to, uh, you can't get rid of anger, but you can put a lid on it to a great extent. Well, One of the things go ahead. One of the things I've been hearing a lot about is, you know, um, I feel sad, I feel frustrated, I feel angry, what should I do? And so much of that is just, we have to feel our emotions, right? They're natural emotions, we have to let them go. And so to some extent, you know, who wouldn't be upset right now, especially as someone who served, you know, there, um, every, every reaction, you know, makes sense. I think it's really, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if it just doesn't you know, if it just stays high, that those feelings and, and they don't go up and down, you don't feel any relief over time. If you feel like it's affecting your functioning, your ability to work, your ability to function as a spouse, a parent, you know, I think that's when, you know, I'd say, go see Rebecca, go see me, that, you know, that, uh, Caitlin, all of us um, and get that help. And, um, you know, so it's, it's finding that line of like, let yourself express those natural emotions. But if they're really too much. Don't don't wait to get help. Come in. Know that there's there's help. Yeah, um, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Dr. Norman, because we have so many partners that are standing ready to help the families that are with us this evening and all across the country. We have an incredible partnership with our friends at Wounded Warrior Project. If you know what they're up to right now, they're contacting forty thousand Afghanistan veteran families from their call center. Can you imagine? The post 9-11 focused organization um, working 24-7 to offer services and support to families who need it. If you need help right now and you're in that category, go to WWP.org. Um, they have a 24-7 operation. Dr. Norman said, when you get to the point where you need help, help is available. You don't have to do this alone. <clears throat> a question for the group. We've got a great uh, number of questions around. Sorry, Steve, can I just follow up really quickly with that? It's also getting help before you get into the crisis. It's okay if you aren't feeling like I am in crisis now, I'm feeling suicidal. All right, I guess it's time to get help. It's okay to get the help beforehand so that you can stave off that crisis too. And as, as you said, Steve, there are so many resources and places where you can do that. One great one is the Cohen Clinic, which you represent, Caitlin, and we thank you and the Cohen Clinic for all the work you're doing and for making yourself available tonight. Um, a lot of questions about the social media habits of folks that are, that are with us tonight. They wanna be mindful of what triggers there are, what things they might do on their social media to ensure that they're not triggering, triggering their brother and sister veterans. This question came from Sean but how do we differ in our social media posts? How do we know if we're helping or, or hurting others with what um, content we're putting out there? It's a tough one, I know, but just anybody have a question or thoughts on that? So I'll just say a few words there. Uh, uh, see, our brain is naturally drawn to three things. It is drawn to threat, uh, it is drawn to novelty, and it is drawn to pleasure. Uh, you know, unlike our sensory system, if you step on a nail, you withdraw your foot, you don't dig deeper. But if you get something scary on the TV, you, you watch more, you don't shut off the TV right away. So that's how we are, we are designed. So what you do is to the extent you can replace threat with novelty. Maybe you love puppies, maybe you love babies, maybe, you know, what is it that really causes oxytocin, the, the bonding hormone to flow within you? And, uh, and, and increase your social media feeds with that because it's, it's eventually engaging your brain in something that easily swaps the focus on threat with focus on novelty and joy and the positive aspect of life. 
Maybe you can play Sudoku with a friend or chess or something else online. Join, you can join one of those online groups. So the more you can get your brain enmeshed in novelty and oxytocin and something uplifting, the less it will need feel the need to go towards threat. I'd like to add to that just a little bit that we know that searching on the internet and Facebook can be a bit of a coping skill for a lot of people. Maybe not the best one, but it is a coping skill. And if you want to stop doing it, that's great, but you need to replace it with a coping, another coping skill. We can't just rip them from ourselves and not have them. And imagine like uh, suddenly stopping smoking, you have to kind of back down off that. So if you've noticed that you're going down rabbit holes and, and things aren't positive for you, and maybe you're even hurting people by what you're putting on the internet, think about things that you could try differently. We can all get sucked into it. Um, I have to get myself up off the couch and go do something to turn off the noise that's in my in my phone and 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 plug in another coping skill. I um, was emailing with a colleague this morning who served in Afghanistan, um, checking in, and he was saying how, you know, connecting with other veterans has been incredibly helpful and his friend group mostly on sort of, you know, their own threads, but also more broadly on social media. And that for him, that's been really positive. And he posted that some things that got a lot of responses he felt in a really good way. So I think it's a thin line, but I think, you know, we know social media can become, a, you know, kind of an addiction. We know it can very quickly turn very negative and very um, divisive. And so um, finding that line where it feels like you're getting the support that you need right now, because certainly support from people who understand it is so, so valuable, but sort of knowing the pitfalls of social media and limiting, limiting the amount of time you're on it and, and getting off when you, know, you find the trolls and things sort of take a turn fast. I call these my 2 a.m. people, Steve. Who can you call at 2 a.m. in the morning who will just pick up the phone and start talking to you and not be judgmental about you? So, uh, so make a list of these 2 a.m. people. You won't have 20 of them. You perhaps won't have even 10 of them. You pro probably have a couple. And uh, so talk to these 2 a.m. people at least a couple of times a week and be a 2 a.m. people person for somebody else. And, and both the processes can uplift us together. Sue, that's that's great advice. I'll just share. I'm I'm lucky to be um, to have the ability to be around family this week. I'm in Rochester, New York, where I'm from. Usually living in D.C., and I have 15 nieces and nephews who've helped me because of the work that I do every day with the Dole Foundation that I'm honored to do. I've been struggling with these images, and they've exposed me to podcasts. Um, and podcasts over the last several days have been a way for me to step back away from social media and to listen to brilliant people like some of you on here who have podcasts um, where there's active listening. Um, and Dr. Sood, a lot of meditative aspects to, to um, um, and resilient aspects to podcasting. So be another area I would encourage people to turn to and perhaps instead of jumping on Twitter or or Facebook, where sometimes we can get we can get put off. Um, a question related to the um, incredible amount of caregivers who are with us this evening. You know, we work at the Dole Foundation, focused on the millions of men and women who provide care and support, who are truly now on the front lines of this withdrawal. In fact, most of the requests for support and the notes that we've been getting at Dole Foundation, a lot of them have been from caregivers who are concerned and. Uh, to your point, Caitlin, earlier, are, are thinking ahead um, with respect to their veterans. They want they want to limit emotional or mental outbursts before they happen, right, or prevent them before they happen. We have a program that offers free respite support um, for caregivers, and our partners at CareLinks, who who made that wonderful support possible, in addition to Wounded Warrior Project, who's underwritten it, and and USAA and Bob Woodruff Foundation. They wanna know how can they better prepare these practitioners who are going into the homes of the folks that we have assembled here to be better stewards of care um, for veterans and caregivers right now in the midst of all this chaos. What are the, what's the advice you would give to those trained healthcare workers to be um, even more supportive of the families that they're going into support right now? Who'd like to take that one? Caitlin? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think it's 
it's so important first and it's so that they're actually going into the homes right so you there the, the the caregiver and the veteran are the family is in their space of comfort and so i think that continuing that also you know one of the things that i i love that you're doing uh, at at elizabeth dole is this is the respite program where there just aren't any excuses to like if people say well i don't have time to to reach out or i don't have time for somebody to come over um because i have to blot like i have to clean the house um there's no excuse we're gonna get help for that um and so i think that the practitioners um kind of working within that sort of getting that that case management type of help is going to be essential so that they can then really dig into what what is going on with the family and what these complications are uh, with the caregivers and and with their veterans. Great. Something I would add to answer that about what care uh, providers can do, you know, these respite providers. Kaylin mentioned psych armor. It's really easy to go online, pull up a video and type in Afghanistan or how to talk to veterans or any kind of type of things. What is PTSD? And watch a little bit of a video. Um, cultural competency is something that as a clinician, whatever you practice in, um, that is in our ethics. Um, and we, we shouldn't practice outside of the scope of that. And so if you're going to be going, you know you're signing up to be a, a caregiver and a clinician in this, for a caregiver, too many caregivers, um, do your research. You know, spend five minutes, educate yourself um, so that you aren't going in there and stepping on toes and, 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 and uh, you know, hurting people because the whole point is to help. And it's not that hard to do the research. Yeah, some of the kind of questions we've been getting um, are kind of like, well, what, what should I expect? How are veterans reacting? You know, what should I do? And I, I think I would take a step back from that and just everyone is an individual, everyone is responding differently. Someone might be okay today, but not tomorrow, but the next day they are. And just to you know, come in without assumptions, ask open-ended questions, see how people are doing, see what their needs are, and then ask again the next time because the answers might be very different than that first visit. My husband always said, it says, if you've met one veteran, you've met one veteran. Um, and that goes for every person, you know. Yeah, um, we often say that there, there is no uniformity across, um, even though they wear uniforms when they're serving, um, the rich diversity of our um, community is one of its endearing qualities. And so it really, we really do need to take a custom approach in the ways that we support and steward um, individual families. Dr. Norman, um, a question from Robert, and he says, um, my veteran is filled with concern and guilt about the interpreters that he worked with in Afghanistan. Um, what can I do to reassure him? Um, and how can we handle the emotions around that reality that's hitting us in the face right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way to put it, the reality. Um, you know, I think caring, you know, being worried about people you care about is incredibly human and, and just shows that you know, Robert's partner has incredibly good values and um, and a strong moral compass. And that's probably where that guilt comes in as well. So, you know, all of those things are a sign of a, of a good human in a very hard position, worrying about someone they care about. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I kind of uh, spoiled my answer here uh, a little earlier in terms of, you know, this is one of those things that um, they can't necessarily control right now. Um, the worry is normal. Um, there might be actions they can find, but otherwise it might be, you know, kind of keeping track of the situation, seeing if there's anything they can do, but otherwise taking good care of themselves. It's great. You know, Steve, the, the world is um, imperfect um, and we have to accept that bad things happen to good people. And uh, that's, you know, we, we don't have the answer to the ultimate question. Uh, you know, we didn't create ourselves. There's, there's a lot of uh, imperfection and lack of, lack of control in the world. And that's, we have to accept that reality. And what I sometimes like to do is when faced with negative news, uh, the more negative news I see, the more positivity I try to create in my own world. 
And when I see the negative news, so there is this difference between empathy and compassion. Empathy is when you're feeling the other, other person's pain. Compassion is when you're doing something about it. Empathy leads to burnout. Compassion is actually uplifting. So the more you validate their struggle, and if you can do something tangible to help them, great. But if you cannot, you can at least pray for them if you believe in the power of prayer. And that can be healing. So whenever you can convert your empathy into compassion. It's great advice. Dr. Sood, I'm going to pose another question to you that we've been getting a lot of. Um, it's from Kendra and many, many others. Um, she um, serves as a caregiver to a Vietnam era veteran. And as you know, a lot of folks are seeing what's happening in Afghanistan that served in Vietnam, and they're thinking back to the circumstances of the Vietnam withdrawal and, and finding similarities in all of all of those feelings of what happened in Saigon and when we came home from Vietnam are compounding with what they're seeing happening in Afghanistan. What do you say to the families who have that sort of double hit um, right now that are feeling the effects of both back to their service in the Vietnam era through to today and what they're seeing in Afghanistan? Yeah, the, the feelings are likely to be similar. As you know, our memories are imperfect. So, so we do not exactly remember things that transpired, but I can easily see how the feelings are very similar and those similar feelings may be translating into finding uh, specific situations that are uh, very similar, but there are a lot of differences too in, in both the situations. So I would start with validation. I would start with uh, validating the emotions and the feelings feelings and how incrementally having these two, uh, uh, two situations can cause a lot of negative emotions. Um, what we would like to do is zoom out and look at uh, the positives, the, the, the good time span, that the good moments that we have had between those two, obviously we even, you know, one war is too many, we don't want to have any, of course. Uh, and uh, if the tea is bitter, then, um, and you don't want to drink the bitter tea, you dilute the tea with honey. So you dilute your, uh, your brain's memories with the positives of uh, the gratitude for what is right, the meaning, if you can find in what seems not so right, uh, the, the connections, the growth, uh, the spirituality, all of that. Um, I think you validate, you educate, uh, you uh, offer your hug and your shoulders, and you, uh, to the extent you can uh, help your loved ones focus on what's, uh, what's right about this world, which is a lot still. Great advice. Lots of questions coming in, and I'd love for, for anyone to jump in on this one, around veterans who are facing civilians who question why they or anyone else served in Afghanistan altogether. Um, you know, which is obviously it's happening as people are seeing us leave and the, the repercussions of that. And that's sad because we know, we all know how much that service meant and how important those missions were that these service members and now veterans undertook on our behalf. But what advice do you have for veterans who are facing those kinds of questions from civilians or neighbors or loved ones? I'd like to speak to that a little bit, Steve. Yeah, go ahead, as, so, uh, you know, my personal story is that I lost my, my husband to suicide after coming back from war. And we spend a lot of time in the survivor community focusing on, you know, the, the way someone dies does not define their life. And, and that's been huge in my recovery and healing from that loss. And I, I can't help but think about that this week. The way this ends, the way this ended um, or is ending does not define how who we are, how you participated, what your worth was in this, what good you did. Um, we have no way of knowing all the things that, that you, these service members prevented from happening on our soil. There are, as a whole generation of Afghanis that, are, that have gone to school, that are, you know, life is better there. And that would never have happened had you not gone. And so when the, you know, enemy of you know, defeat starts talking in your head that this is worthless and people are saying, you know, ugly things. Just remember that the way something ends doesn't define what it was. It, it, it has no power over that. And when you kind of release that, it, it changes things, I think. Yeah, I could add. Yes, please go ahead. I could add more to the beautiful things that Rebecca's saying, you know, 
this is the end at this moment, but this is just a moment. This is part of the process. This is part of history. Um, things, you know, all things go up and down and continue to change. And we have no idea what the contributions um, that our service members made, um, what differences, if, we know they've already made huge differences, the things Rebecca mentioned, and the things they'll make in the future, the way the future will unfold and how those things will continue. What those people who got into education who wouldn't have otherwise, what they will go on to do and how they will go on to transform Afghanistan and the world. You know, we're just in a moment of time. And so hope is not lost. We, we will see the seeds of those efforts grow. You know, Dr. Norman, you brought up something very important and through all the thickness and friction of the news, some of the stories that are being lost are a lot of the resilient folks in Afghanistan who amidst some of the advances in the Taliban are determined, some of the media organizations that have emerged and the schools and, and, and think tanks and community service organizations and nonprofits who are all determined to continue to do their work under an emerging new regime. And so um, those are some of the things that I've been focusing on, right? And paying attention to is my hope that those glimmers of hope in Afghanistan will continue. And that even if they aren't temporarily paused, that we know they happened, right? And that we know that um, those, those glimmers of hope are possible. Um, Dr. Norman, another question for you. We're hearing a lot about moral injury um, in the chat room. You know, something that's something you deal with um, in your work with PTS. Um, and um, how would you counsel our folks around what happens beyond PTSD and, and, and this concept of, of moral injury? Um, what are folks, what are things that folks should be on the lookout for um, beyond PTSD and around suicidal ideation spikes and moral injury? Yeah, you know, so moral injury often goes hand in hand with trauma, especially around war. It's kind of, some people call it those moral impacts of war or the, um, the existential part of having been through something that sort of no one should really go through and having to make sense of it and find a way forward. Um, and I think for people who maybe already had some moral distress about some of their, you know, um, some of the things that happened during their service, this moment now where, you know, people are also questioning, like, was it worth it? Like, did it mean anything? Just really compounds that. So I think this is really a time where moral injury um, can flare up and that moral distress. And so, you know, again, I think it really comes back to so many of the things we've been talking about around meaning making and taking that broader perspective on where we are and what's happening and, and what, you know, the impacts of your service, the impact on you, on others, um, on the seeds that were planted for the future um, and kind of taking that big picture approach. But certainly we know that that sense of moral injury can be related to, you know, risk of thinking about suicide or, you know, other suicide risk factors and having worse PTSD and more depression. So again, you know, don't suffer alone, get help. Those can be very hard things to talk about. Those moral injury kind of memories can be the hardest to share, the hardest to get help for. Sometimes people think they don't deserve to get help because of those moral injuries. Get help, just reach out to any of these resources we've discussed, reach out. With that, if I can just um, add, we also reaching out and getting help because it works. Like that's one thing that we always need to remember that we all know from the research, from everything that we've been doing from our own experiences, we know that reaching out and talking and getting help, going to Rebecca, you know, calling, calling the consultation service, seeing Dr. Sood helps and it, people do get better. So just continue to remember that, that, you know, we, you hear that all the time. Well, just reach out and get help. Well, go talk to somebody. Uh, okay. But why? Because it works. Um, and we know that. And so don't, don't forget that part of it. Caitlin, a, a very simple, but so important piece of advice that you just gave. We know that so many in our community, there's this stigma around asking for help, right? Um, and you all have gotten around that a little bit by joining us tonight. Um, but Caitlin's right, it does work. All the folks who are, who are with us tonight, these experts, my friends, we're here for you, working with them and, and their colleagues or calling the Cohen Clinic or Wounded Warrior Project or Code of Support or 
any of the other great organizations, the American Legion, VFW, Vietnam Veterans Association of America, it works. They're going to connect you with someone who can help you. I'd like to ask a question of all the folks who joined us tonight. I'm seeing a lot of really great chatter. Folks are sharing some things that they do that help them cope. I saw someone just write, I go out and pick blackberries with my daughter. Rebecca, you talked about having a horse farm. I talked about podcasts. I'd love as we're coming down to the, the last few minutes here, and we're gonna, we're gonna challenge ourselves to continue a little bit beyond nine here, because we got a lot of great questions still. Offer some advice to your friends on what do you do that helps you cope? Is it picking blackberries? Give some tips to folks who are looking in the chat box for what, what you do that helps you cope. Dr. Sood, um, next question is for you. We've um, got a lot of questions from folks about um, how do I intervene at a really acute moment with my veteran or with my child when it seems like they've completely shut down or they've completely withdrawn or they're having a severe panic attack. Um, what advice do you have in those acute moments? And I'd really, I'd love to hear from a couple of folks, but I'll start with Dr. Suit. Yeah, so I uh, follow uh, and I've had personally moments where I have almost decompensated or have had near panic attack. And so the first thought is to stop uh, uh, your thought uh, to the extent you can. And there, uh, deep breathing really helps because when you are in that state, when you are high, high wired and anxious, your adrenaline level is very high. Your heart rate is beating above 120 beats per minute. No rational thinking is possible when your heart is beating at 120 per minute or, or more. So I practice deep breathing. <clears throat> we have a particular form called the star breathing, but any, any way that you can have deep diaphragmatic breathing to wash off that adrenaline. And then I try to reframe and think about the situation differently. And uh, this could be think about uh, think about uh, a bunny in my yard or think about a cute child or something or the person who has hurt me, I might see them as a 90 year old or as a two year old, somehow reframe it or think about what went right within what went wrong. How can I think about this differently? So, so you stop uh, your thought process, you deep breathe, wash off your adrenaline and reframe or reimagine the situation. And then you re-engage. Those are the three steps I personally take. It's great advice. Other perspectives from anyone? Definitely not as um, intelligent as Dr. Sood, um, because when I have moments of panic, I cannot think. Um, it's a total overload. And I've, I've seen that in a lot of people too. So um, uh, something that really works and has worked in my practice this week when someone was panicking was to get on the floor. I know that sounds very simple, but to get grounded, literally touch the floor, drink something cold. Um, I squeezed someone's feet today when they were panicking and that brought them back to earth. Um, grab a dog, put it in your face. Anything you can do to wake up your senses because your brain is going out of control and you got to bring yourself back to your body. Um, so for me, it's, you know, is there an ice cold Dr. Pepper around and can I lay my body on the floor or cocoon in a bunch of blankets to, to bring myself back to reality? Rebecca, thanks for calling me intelligent, but you are more practical than I am. <laughs> <laughs> we make a good team, Dr. Soon. That's right. I'll, I'll throw I'll throw you on the floor and you you make me think about things. I'm sorry. Okay. I like like a dog. <laughs> yeah. so, Rebecca, a question that's come up over and over and over again in the chat room. It's a really great one. We got a particular note from one caregiver who said, "I can't explain it, but I'm suddenly reliving those difficult first horrible moments of seeing my wounded warrior for the first time in the emergency room after she was injured." Can you explain why some caregivers might be feeling this right now? Yeah. Trauma is stored in our body. It doesn't go away. It's always going to be in there somewhere. My brilliant, my personal brilliant therapist always tells me that situations can see, sound the same, smell the same, taste the same, feel the same, but they're not the same. And that's the thing that I always help people try to remember. If I was up for a tattoo, that's what I would say. This is not the same. 
So when you're, when you're in a stressful experience, there's almost like a tether that can connect back to the, the stressful experience. So seeing your person there and it triggers it and zips it right to it. And we have to cut that cord and break it and provide a little bit of space for our brain to realize that this is not the same. When I see uh, images of the Middle East and strife on TV, I immediately go back to when my late husband was deployed and how scared I was. And I have to break that cord and provide a little bit of space to say, okay, this is not the same. And, and you know, for some of us that the, the PTSD is strong, the, the trauma is strong and you need treatment. And I'm a, I am the poster child that treatment works because I, I don't trigger it like that anymore. And you don't have to live that way. So if this feels like it's heavy and it's, and it's bringing up more than just a little bit, I recommend getting in with someone um, early because the earlier you get help, the better you're gonna be. That's great, Rebecca, thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Norman, um, a lot of questions about, and I'm, I know you don't have a crystal ball, none of us do, but a lot of questions about, is there a way that we can predict how long the emotional, social emotional impacts of this acute situation are gonna last? Um, I think folks are trying to think about, you know, What's it look like in, in a week or a month? Uh, what are your comments on that? A lot of times what we see in these cases where kind of the whole country is reacting is, um, you know, the news cycle moves on very sadly, sometimes inappropriately. Um, and I think what we see in general after a disaster, a crisis, um, which maybe is what we can compare this to, although it's not a perfect comparison at all, is, that kind of everyone is upset. Most people have a really hard time initially. And a lot of people, it kind of settles and they go back to their baseline. And then there's some number of people who kind of stay at that ramped up level. They don't kind of, it doesn't naturally go back to that um, normal where they normally are day to day. Um, and, and we see that over and over and over again. And it, you know, it could be 5%, 10%, 20% of people, it could be 50% of people. But I think that's one of the things we're looking for. I love the message my co-panelists have been sending around don't wait. Like if you have an inkling of I might need help, get it now. It's there for you. There's no right, to, you don't have to wait till any point. But I would say if you're still here where you are right now in a month and two months, you know, it gets harder to resolve on its own the longer it's with you. So at that point, if you haven't reached out yet, I really would. Thank you. Um, you want to stop, sorry. You want to stop the avalanche as early as possible because if it goes too far out, it's difficult to handle. There's a condition, Steve, which is in which you cannot forget things. And patients who have that condition, there's very few patients in the world, they have a lot of stress because they just can't forget anything, including negative experiences. Fortunately, the human brain has the ability to forget. This is one situation where forgetting can help. We don't like to forget, but at least things get buried uh, over a period of time. And the more you can bury and eventually heal it the the better uh, and and so get help early before the avalanche is too far advanced one note about help is that it doesn't have to last forever you don't have to go to therapy for years i i um offer cognitive processing therapy which is 12 sessions and then you're at least 50 percent better so i i i think a lot of people think therapy has to be you know, 20 years with the same person. And it doesn't, it, it can, you can resolve things and just need, get a little support when you need it. Yeah, I wanna to add to that, that when you have an effective treatment like cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, these are PTSD specific treatments, which isn't what everyone has, but for those who do, you know, when things happen in the future, of course, you're gonna be upset. Of course, you're gonna react, but often people who've had these treatments and they've been effective for them, a session or two and, and they're, they're doing okay. They really have a lot of sticking power. Great, great comments. I'm gonna offer a closing question. I'm gonna tempt people to stay with us for a couple more minutes because Dr. Sood is gonna close us this evening with a meditative exercise. I've done this with him before. It can totally change your day. So I invite you to stick around for a couple more minutes for that wonderful exercise that he's gonna walk us through. I wanna pose this closing question to each of you. We're coming up on the weekend. 
Um, it's been a rough week um, uh, for, for me. Um, I can tell you I'll value from this question. I know everybody watching will value. Um, what are some activities that you recommend, some practical things that our viewers can do to promote self-care as we head into the weekend? Who wants to start? I'll Dr. suggest, oh. go ahead. I'll suggest um, actually um, a couple of apps. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few great self-care, self-help apps. There's um, COVID Coach, which someone already put in the comments and also PTSD Coach or PTSD Coach Online, which is a website. And the reason I suggest this is because they're a whole toolkit. They're not just one self-care strategy, but you go in and you say, nope, like down, thumb down for that one, thumbs up for this one. And you get suggestions that are things that fit you very individualized. So it's like a whole treasure chest of potential things that could really work for you. That's awesome. Caitlin, what is your parting advice for the weekend? I, I think it's giving yourself permission to have fun sometime, in some way. It's okay. You don't have to be feeling so lousy all the time and thinking about this have a little distraction. Um, one of the things that I always that I always tell people is go back to that like 1990s or whatever generation you're in movie that you know that is comfortable, that's kind of funny. Like for me, it's clueless or, you know, just something just light, but I also know it. Like it isn't something, you know, violent or something very new. Um, similarly, like Top Chef, I'm in a total Top Chef, like, Mar marathon right now. Um, when I was very sick last year um, with COVID, I watched um, I watched a Project Runway nonstop because Tim Gunn made me feel better. If that means anything to you, but um, but it's that sort of like that sort of remember. Think about what feels good and and just freaking do it. Feeling great advice. Give yourself permission to get away from that television, right, um, Rebecca. Uh, my advice is always, always going to be go outside because it's really hard to feel like everything is so big when you look up and see beautiful stars or the sun, or if you're in a city, you see the big tall buildings. Um, you know, I have an equine therapy practice and I know everybody doesn't have horses in their backyard, but that's my thing is going and just nuzzling a horse or mind, mindfully brushing um, uh, the, the thing that's been helpful to me recently is I put in a, an arena and a sand area to ride and to do therapy in, and I didn't pay attention to it too well. And so it got some grass in it. So for the last two days, my husband and I have gone out in the sweltering heat and pulled weeds and the backs of my legs are so sore and I'm pretty sunburned, but that mindless, um, mindless yet mindful activity of just repetitive and I can see what I've done. I can see the the progress has been very, very helpful. And I um, feel like I should pay my arena for the therapy it's given me. Um, so get outside if you can, um, or look at pictures of outside. Um, the world is big and not all of it is bad right now. There's a lot of good. Great, great advice. Dr. Sood, um Right before you lead us, um, I'm going to make some quick closing remarks and then turn back to you for the meditation. But what advice do you have ahead of that? Yeah, I have two thoughts. One is uh, go around the family and think about the, your most impactful act of kindness. This is called counting kindness intervention, where when you think about the kindest thing you have done and you share with others, it uh, hopefully makes you happier, makes you feel worthy and helps others with happiness. That's one. Two is think about, be creative and think about something annoying that you're grateful for. So when I did this practice, one of my colleagues said, I'm really grateful for her husband. And she shared that with him. And he said, oh, you're grateful for me. And she said, well, the deal was I had to be grateful for someone who is annoying. <laughs> and so uh, he, well, he got back at her and he said, I'm really grateful for you too. So <laughs> think about something really annoying that you're grateful for. That is very relatable for many of us, Dr. Sood. Um, it could be dangerous to relationships. <laughs> well, it was all in good humor. Yeah, yeah, I got a list. Well, yeah. reminder, stick with us for another minute or two after my closing remarks. Dr. Sood's gonna take us through a meditative exercise. I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us for this important discussion. 
I wanna thank each and every one of you for your service and your commitment to this country, your commitment to one another. There's a reason you wanted to be here to help others. For all the caregivers who've joined us, we encourage you to sign up for our Hidden Heroes Caregiver Community if you've not done so at hiddenheroes.org. You can find connection, validation, and community. And for all of you, please be on the lookup for a follow-up email from us tomorrow that will include all the links to the resources that were mentioned and to timely information. This is the first of what we plan on being several conversations to help you get through this tough time. And we wanna hear from you what you need from us. So let's continue to lean on each other. Let's continue to ask for help when we need it and rally behind our military and veteran community. Dr. Sood, it's over to you. Oh, thank you. It's such a privilege. And this is going to be very brief, about three minutes long. So uh, the, the origin of this is uh, uh, I've been married 27 years, and I realized that after 12, 15 years of marriage, my mornings were becoming very transactional. So I would wake up uh, either irritated or greeted by these guys. So I said, okay, before I leave my bed, I tried a lot of different things. And I thought, I'm just going to think about something good my wife has said or done in the last few days. And that really changed our morning time. So I'll take you through this morning gratitude practice. It's about three minutes long. So I invite you to close your eyes and we'll just practice waking up in the morning. Um, so imagine you're waking up in the morning and try to go back to this morning, what side of the bed you woke up. Try to recall the color of the floor you saw. And then think about the first person in your life who matters a lot to you, someone very special. Look at their smiling face. And then send that person your silent gratitude for being in your life. Second person, go back to the first memory of this person, the first time you saw him or her. Then send your silent gratitude. Third person, and let this person be someone on this call who is with you right now. Maybe Steve. Look into the eyes of this person and notice the color of the eyes. And then send your silent gratitude. Go back in time to a happy moment in your childhood. Maybe your birthday or some other happy moment. Recall your hairstyle at that time. And then send a warm hello to your happy, innocent self. Think about someone who has passed away who you loved. Give that person a virtual hug. And then send silent gratitude to that person. Take a deep breath. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saud. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Um, I feel better. I hope you all feel better. I see so many appreciative comments that this time together was valuable. That makes our heart sing. That's what we hope for tonight. 
stay in close touch with us, stay in close touch with one another and your family, your neighbors. Keep in mind all this wonderful advice that we've got from our friends here and to our friends, our experts, thank you so much. You made a big difference for a lot of people tonight. Um, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you all again. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.